Welcome to week three of the Aquatics Roundtable. And just as a general reminder, like we've done in previous weeks, everybody is in the same boat, but all of our states and our universities are handling the COVID-19 response a little bit differently. And this is a safe space to share what you're doing. And also this should be judgment free. So if you have questions about why someone is doing something a certain way, please respectfully ask or talk about that. So uh, I would like to thank NERSA for all of their support during this time. It has been so lovely to see so many aquatics professionals in one space. I can say that this has never happened for me before and I've really appreciated um, this opportunity. So last week we were fortunate enough to have the, a lot of the American Red Cross reps and uh, their talk was super, super helpful and they had a lot of really good resources and I think answered a lot of great questions. So if you weren't able to attend that roundtable, please go ahead and check out the roundtable from last week because they answered a lot of, I think, common questions and gave us a lot of really good resources. So just like the other weeks, we will have um, the chat up. So if you could go ahead and open up your chat function and um, introduce yourself, where you're from, uh, what your name is, maybe a favorite baked good or activity since we've all been um, at home isolating. I am Rochelle Williams. I'm from Western Washington University and I created a sourdough starter. So I made bagels yesterday, which I think has been my favorite thing so far. When we are going through today, um, I'll be posing questions, discussion questions, and then please feel free to unmute yourself and to share. I will also be monitoring the um, chat for any additional topics, and we will, I'll be trying my best to insert those topics as we have time. So um, I was given a great question to talk about today to kind of lead us off. And um, I would love to hear what people are planning for kind of their future of onboarding and hiring as this uh, self quarantine and stay from home orders seem to be extending. Um, so when you are thinking about either summer or you're trying to hire for fall, what are some things that you are looking into implementing for hiring and then onboarding new staff members. So we're not at the point for um, new hires right now. However, I am uh, will sorry I will be working on head guard applications for my current staff, and that those will be going out either at, in uh, end of April or hope beginning of May. But depending on if there's any extensions to quarantine, we might I might extend those in past May, uh, depending on the current situation. But right now, I'm just trying to think of how to fairly. Judge it because I usually I have head guards reapply every year in the spring, and but really this time it's basically basing off the performance of the fall semester and then February, and that's essentially it for how open we were for spring. So I'm just trying to think of ways to uh, grade and determine applications. I definitely um, I'm kind of in the same boat as you guys there uh, with this hiring. Uh, we just got done opening up our aquatic center actually in October <laughs> and we faced a lot of these hiring challenges there with getting staff. We have to have uh, at my facility 19 lifeguards on shift at a time um, and uh, we're rev revving up. We just got out of our spring break. So, um, you know, uh, this has kind of uh, been a tough time there. What we're doing though is our HR. I work for a uh, city government and they're still allowing us to do onboarding. Um, and then what we're doing is with the lifeguards we have on right now, I have about 25 that are on staff that were hired for the spring, early summer. Uh, we're actually doing virtual in-services through Microsoft Teams just to get them six to 10 hours a week or so just to kind of keep them engaged and such. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the hiring is, is definitely a thing. Also in Florida, we have the retirement system here. Um, and because we're part of FRS, uh, we can only have our seasonal lifeguards work five months and then they have to cycle off for a month. So that's another big struggle is timing it, you know, there. So COVID might have actually helped us for the summertime is if we don't bring those staff on until late May, early June, we can now get a full summer out of them versus we brought them on in April. Hey, 
Hey, hey, thank you. Aaron Wells from University of Texas at Austin. One thing that we were talking about in a meeting today was doing some blended learning um, to onboard, but with this indefinite when are we going back it's we're trying to think about okay well when do we start this blended learning because they only have the 90 day window i'm seeing a lot of people shaking their heads at me um because we only have that 90 day window between finishing the blended learning and um testing out on skills so that has put a wrinkle into everything for us and trying to figure out what that looks like has anybody started processing that as well Drake Belt from the University of Arizona. We're looking at all of our staff right now to recertify not only the lifeguard staff, but the whole department staff. And so we're gonna try our best to do it in chunks. Um, for our lifeguard staff specifically, we have one person that we're gonna push to like the 29th day of their 30 day expiration and have them do that online blended learning because they can still be expired and then push them through 90 days later if we can. Sorry, it says my volume was almost up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we are like basically allowing some of our staff to uh, expire. And then within that 30 day window that they have to recertify, introduce that blended learning process to them. And then we'll do it in rotations with our staff to try to be as accommodating as possible. Great, thanks, Drake. Is there anybody that, so I've heard teams, I've heard implementing blended learning when you're trying, when you have like a potential date for opening. Um, has anybody thought about how you're going to actually onboard folks, like what software systems or um, what type of setup that will look like? I think the other thing we can look to do, and I have talked with my uh, city here, and we're going to do that, is we all understand, you know, when COVID's gone, um, you know, we all are going to be in our summertime operations. So I think setting that precedence now of, you know, maybe we go back to a modified spring schedule or a modified winter schedule where we're not opening full facility. We have to do a slow opening for what we can do. You know, for me, in the wintertime, my staff go from 19 to only needing to, um, to cover a competition pool. So, you know, getting that rev up and such. We use NeoGov, which if anybody uses it, God bless you. It's a, <laughs> it's a very uh, uh, fun system there. But what we've done is using that Microsoft Teams as I've gotten with HR and we're able to facilitate the onboarding, the sunshine law, um, the bloodborne pathogens, all that stuff there. We kind of take that formalized training ourselves because a lot of that stuff we touch on in our lifeguard curriculum and such like that, so. One, one good thing, uh, at, at the University of Wyoming, they have a free online uh, bloodborne pathogen training that only takes 30 minutes and pretty much covers ex everything as does the, in the Red Cross one, minus obviously the in-person one. Normally I have a bunch of fake blood I buy every Halloween at Walmart and they have to practice cleaning it up on a tarp. Um, obviously we can't do that right now, but the, just the fact that we have some way of getting some BBP certifications during, right now is really helpful. So if anyone has resources like that at their universities or institutions, I would definitely consider sending those out to your staff. Great, thank you. And I know Adam, you had mentioned um, your fall evaluations for your staff. Has anybody thought about how they're going to do their staff evaluations or if you're going to do staff evaluations? Um, during this closure? Yeah, so at the University of Houston, we are proceeding with our staff evaluations and essentially we do a 360 type of review. Um, so what I did is I took our rubric that we typically use and I put it into Google Forms and I sent that link out um, for them to fill out those. They still have to fill out the same number I compile them and I'll still utilize um, like our sheet that we use to grade them and then I'll have one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings with each of them for that. Great, thank you. And in the Zoom, or not in the, well, we're on Zoom. In the chat, I've been seeing Zoom, um, Qualtrics, Kara, I love Google Forms for that. Um, 
great. So I think if anybody is looking for spaces to um, create these virtual online um, onboardings, um, I've heard Teams, I've heard introducing blended learning, um, I've heard Google Forms and Zoom, and we're also exploring Canvas on uh, my campus as well, because Canvas is already familiar to the students instead of trying to introduce them to Zoom. So um, that's another thing that we have been doing. And I see not limited to shift assignments and services onboarding manuals. Yep, those are all a good place to kind of keep all of your main documents that may have only been in printed form previously. And I did want to add, we are doing this because we got permission to pay them. If I hadn't gotten permission to pay them for these, I, I wouldn't be proceeding. So just to be respectful of their time. And then has anybody had any, that is a great segue into looking at the fiscal implications of all of this. Um, at my current university, we are only allowed to pay our work study students because they already have those funds released to them. Um, and I won't be doing evals until I can pay my staff because I can't pay them right now. Has anybody else had that situation where you're able to pay your staff or you're not able to pay your staff and how, how are you working around that right now? So the University of Arizona is currently paying all the student employees that worked for Campus Rec Department. However, we're only paying employees their average hours worked this semester per position which really de-incentivize us offering any additional trainings online because they're already getting paid, not having to come in. So we are um, not currently going to be doing any online trainings with the staff until we roll into our summer um, rotation. Greg, um, I think we're, we have a meeting about that in 20, 30 minutes, but um, I think we're doing the same thing basing it off their hours they worked between January and spring break, which is what they would have done throughout the semester. Um, I don't believe we can give them additional stuff that exceeds those hours. I do plan trying to give them like some professional development videos or opportunities, maybe like, hey, why don't you guys analyze this lifeguard rescue? Tell me what you think, just to keep their engagement, because I'm just worried about them uh, forgetting that they are employed until summer rolls around. I think the important thing for a lot of uh, as we're in this environment and we see it across the country and keeping the employees paid as much as possible is definitely uh, like i said for most of my seasonals i'm able to keep them at 10. Uh, my full-time staff you know are maintaining their 40 right now but the important part of it is finding tasks for them to do so that way we're accountable to these hours but i think uh, as we as this covid 19 continues on i think a lot of our employees are going to look back at us and say what did we do for them at one of the toughest times in history. And that's really gonna stick with them for um, you know, how they view us and how they view the, the certain facilities they're working at there. Uh, Joey from ASU, we got permission to pay our staff who, because we had a week between spring break and us closing down. So we had a, we decided uh, to pay our staff um, who are who were able to come back after spring break and book hours for us and we're planning to be here when our facility closed um, and they they were they lost their jobs at then so um, for but the same thing as Drake said at UA uh, we're struggling because it's not it doesn't incentivize our staff to, to work um, sorry a plane just flew overhead um, and uh, so we're, we're kind of holding off on, on giving them trainings until we know we're going to open back up and then we're going to, we're going to have more required trainings and stuff like that. Hi, um, this is Jennifer from Stanford University. Um, we're not allowed to pay our aquatic staff at this time. Um, anyone that was about to expire for certification um, that wanted to um, do any of the Stanford online training was given the opportunity to let us know and no one reached out. So we closed that opportunity. And so now no one is allowed to work until further notice for part-time staff. Um, but what me and my coordinator are doing are um, creating a whole bunch of on-shift assignments. So when they do come back, um, 
are, everyone seems to be concerned, including myself, is like, oh, they're going to forget everything. So how can we help them regain that knowledge as quickly as possible? So just having on-shift assignments that can be done when they're not on stand, when after they rotate and all their other um, reserve guard duties are done, there's like uh, lifeguarding assignments that we're creating. So um, that's one way we're trying to keep them um, for when they come back. And then just updating everything, um, planning for in-services. So when we do come back, what um, what we're doing at the, uh, what we are doing at each one of them and just trying to get as prepared as possible. So when, when we come back, we can help them in any way we can and don't have to do all that stuff, um, updating or anything like that and, and can just focus on the staff. Yeah. On that note, we basically told our directors that we need a week to train before we open the pool after the rec center is open, because I don't want to rely on them you know, remembering things while we're out here and, or even on the remote trainings that we're offering, we want to have them hands on, you know, practice our emergency action plan, run through drills before we put them back in the stand. Great, thank you so much. Um, and Drake, I appreciate the shout. I will add that to the list and we will circle back to alternative programming. So we're all pretty limited right now um, as far as what we can do for our staff. And I, it is great that y'all are able, for the folks that are able to pay people, um, I, this is really helpful for me to bring back to my university to be like, this is what a lot of people are doing. Why can't we do this? So thank you all so much. Um, have y'all been able to start to look at the fiscal implications of what this is going to do for your operations when you open back up whenever that time is, such as um, maybe reduced schedules, reduced number of staff, um, programming, that type of stuff. Has anybody started to look at that? And then um, how is this going to affect your operations? I, I still have a follow-up to that. Does anyone have an actual reopen date, in official reopen date in mind at this time? And if so, when in the ballpark is that? Because we at the at University of Ireland, we don't have a reopen date on the schedule right now at all. I don't think any of us do. We have been told that for Arizona, we're looking at offering programming in July, which would mean that we would have to open sometime in June. I don't think that's going to happen, but that's what we have been told from upper administration. Yeah, Carlos Garcia, it's like I know. We just got word that all our classes for summer two have now gone on online. So at this time, so we don't have a date. Yeah, one thing I'm really concerned about is if we do suddenly get a reopen date, but kids are, the students are spread across the country, back home remote, it's gonna make getting them back and getting them recertified, because I have several staff that I know need full on the recertification course um, at this time, because I was planning on doing it this month. But uh, that's one thing I'm concerned about is getting staff back when we reopen and getting them all certified. Well, and I think there needs to be a difference between um, allowed back on campus and when facilities reopen. I do not think that it can happen simultaneously. And I think we need to just make sure that we are talking to our senior staffs about that and keeping them in the loop as to where our students are and what's and what's going on with them, because they need they need that information so that they can make the right decisions. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Aaron. And we're even, we're, you know, right now in Texas, they're saying, you know, we can go back out on May 1st or whatever. So we're even hosting like online job fair right now and saying that we're reopening in May, which I don't think is going to happen, but we haven't been told otherwise. So we're just kind of, you know, doing things to, to prep for that, but not sure that it's actually going to happen. It's a weird place to be in. And for financial implications, uh, I, I, I think for me and my staff, that's one thing I have not, um, not thought about now. Um, I'm an assistant supervisor, so I handle the budget a lot there, but my supervisor mainly deals with, you know, the budget there. But for staff, um, you know, at this point in time, I think all of our budgets are all sorts of out of whack. Um, but I, I think for the, uh, our arena, um, we're so heavily dependent on staffing time. So actually in this COVID time, we should be seeing some sort of savings per se. I'll put that in quotation mark because we're not spending that on staff right now. You know, yes, we got chemicals, we got pumps that are running all that stuff, but 
Um, I, I think for our arena there, um, our issue is going to be going back to what Aaron said was when people can come back, when can they actually come back? And that's going to be what the best thing for us is going to be there. Yeah, and just um, for to throw numbers out there, our we're losing about two hundred fifty thousand dollars in student fees and another twenty thousand dollars in projected revenue for spring term. And then if this goes through fall or not fall, if this goes through summer and we have to cancel summer camps and group swim lessons, we'll be potentially losing up to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in projected revenue, and um, also, this, our students fought to have to pay the smallest amount of fee possible for spring term because they're not on campus. Um, and I tried to remind my staff that if you want the services to still be here in the condition they were when you left, you need to continue to support them. And um, so we're looking at summer hours as soon as we open, regardless of when that is, and the pool will probably have um, massively reduced hours. We're usually open from open to close and now we will probably be open for basically a 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. swim and 11 to 1 and like a 4 to 7 swim. So that's kind of what um, we've already started to look into and that may even roll into fall depending on how long it takes us to not recover from this but not have to dip into our reserves. Has anybody been looking into any anything like that? I think that goes back to um, like hours are going to be reduced even when we are able to open up again hours are going to be reduced and um, for budgetary purposes, for staffing purposes, I just, I think hours are going to be reduced for a while anyway. Um, I do think we had a, an interesting conversation in a, like a student affairs leadership thing today, a, a Zoom meeting today, and one of the comments was made was, if we're back in the fall. So I know that, I think it was um, Jacob brought it up in our risk management meeting last time about like, what are we going to do when this supposedly comes back again in the fall and how are we prepping for that and what's like having the necessary supplies on hand and all of that stuff. I think like we need to start thinking future and what that looks like for us. Yeah, I completely agree, Erin. And um, that is a great segue into the next question. So um, since we've been looking at the fiscal, potentially the fiscal implications of everything and maybe we have to have a different schedule than we previously had and um, maybe we still have social distancing guidelines and rigorous cleaning expectations. Has anyone begun to look at what your new normal potentially will look like when you are able to open? Um, <clears throat> I just got off a, a call with uh, Connect2 and they brought up a, a great point in their aquatics uh, roundtable call of journey mapping. Um, and basically what that is, is walking through your facility and seeing all the potential areas of contamination or touch that would need to be disinfected, starting from when people walk through the door, through turntables, uh, that uh, person at the front desk holding the phone, all those different areas and updating our, our cleaning uh, list and our uh, task duties to kind of reflect that uh, if we need to update those cleaning protocols. I think this COVID has definitely uh, opened up a lot of a lot of things we were not looking at. We have we have a lot of people working from home. We we can see that we can reduce hours in our office and such like that. Um, so I definitely think our cleaning schedule will be changing. Um, you know, it's unfortunate it took some crazy virus to spread out to show us you know to deep clean these areas and such like that. But you know, we have cleaning companies that come through such like that. Um, but uh, that will definitely, um, you know, change the way that, uh, you know, we continue to clean and such. The other thing I wanted to mention, which a uh, few people had mentioned earlier, is I think setting or getting together with your specific universities groups um, and having a discussion that makes sense of when an opening. 
Uh, we keep putting a lot of numbers out there, you know, March 1st, March 15th, April 1st, April 15th, and setting a date that's out there. You, we can always come back early. We cannot come back after the date. So, you know, we, we know that here in Florida, it's been April 30th. Our governor put a stay at home order. Um, you know, we're all pretty intelligent people. We can see where we're going. April 30th is really not looking like it, but that's a number we've kind of set with right now. So instead of coming out and saying, hey, we've reevaluated, you know, May 30th, maybe it, I saw somebody here said May 31st, if these stay closed. Remember, we can always open up earlier from there. That's the best case scenario is we, we hear and say, oh yeah, May 1st is gonna work, but I think setting those realistic expectations first, um, you know, has to be done. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, does anybody have anything else as far as what your new normal is going to look like when you're opening up? Like especially in the pool, has anyone thought about having um, participant limits or um, anything like that? So we were wondering if we do have um, Autumn Cleverly from University of Cincinnati what it would look like if we still have social distancing in place and you know maybe even extending that from the six feet because if you are heavy breathing that you know there's been studies about it needs to be 16 feet so are you guys thinking about like every three or four lanes just to get even extra distance um that's something we've been talking about and just wanted to see if anyone else has any idea like that Hi there. I, we've uh, actually started looking at what our reopening plan might look like. A uh, couple of ideas we've come up with is uh, decrease our group swim lesson op options um, and go strictly to private or semi-private, uh, limiting the amount of people that are allowed in a water aerobics class. Uh, we typically have 40 to 50 people. Um, so we looked at possibly holding on a water aerobics class every hour for three hours and only limiting it to so many people based on our square footage of the pool. Um, we've also looked at, we have 350 master swimmers uh, that have 25 practices a week. So we've looked at reducing the amount of people that are allowed into a practice. So maybe having some kind of sign up, uh, first come first serve, something to where we can limit it to we were looking at limiting uh, one or two people to a lane because typically we have seven or eight people in a lane. So uh, lane usage, lane activity, amounts of people in the pool, um, moving lifeguard stands, making sure we don't have uh, lifeguards standing next to each other. Um, when we rotate, uh, we've looked at a plan of rotating at least six to 10 feet apart. Um, so we've actually started uh, putting a plan in place for those types of things when we reopen. What would your rotations look like um, from six to 10 feet apart? Like, would you, like, is there going to be a disinfecting um, scenario to that? Or would they have their own tubes? Like, what, yeah, are, so what does that look we're like? Lucky, we're lucky enough, uh, all, all of my staff have, are, we have enough tubes to have every, uh, every person assign their own tube. They all have their own fanny pack, their own mask. Uh, so we would just make sure that uh, at shift rotations, there's some kind of sanitation cleaning um, or we order more and have an additional supply that we won't have to kind of uh, cross contaminate if, that, if that's the situation. Yeah, so uh, Carlos Garcia texting now, I'll chime in real quick. When, right before we closed down, I know we were one of the last ones to kind of close down our facility. We actually went to that where um, we had the guards transition a little early on the rotation. We actually put a disaffected cleaning bottle on the lifeguard stand where they would wipe the whole thing down before they'd actually get in the, into the chair. So we went from 15 minute rotations to 20 minute rotations. And everybody did have their own guard tube with them in transition with that tube to all the locations. Does, does anybody have experience um, maybe doing like a lane reservation so that maybe there's only one person per lane, but people know when their reservation time is so that they're not just sitting there waiting? I think that lane reservation, you're going to get into a situation where you've got all these people, at least at UK, I'm, I'm with UK, 
We have people who just jump in a lane and not even bother asking if they can get in. So having those people out on the pool deck, they're gonna get in, especially my master swimmers. And I know you, uh, Yvonne said she had like 325 a panic because everybody wants to start swimming. If we get them out on the pool deck, they're just gonna go. I mean, and then we've got them all hoarding maybe in your lobby area. Where are you gonna put those guys? Um, it is gonna be difficult for us. And, and obviously this discussion is great because we were open three days later and I tried to enforce one person to a lane during rec swim. But then when we had our master's practice, I was trying to push um, one group at one end of the pool and one on the other so they could at least train. I, I think our training for our teams is gonna be almost impossible if we're still involved with all that. One of the other things that we're looking at is uh, points of entry into our facility. So instead of having one point of entry like we do now, we're also looking at expanding that to, you know, can we have swimmers entering the pool deck from a different area, people going into the workout area and the club going into a different section. So we're trying to look at that as well. The other thing to keep in mind as well is when we're looking at these social distance groups, we have to include our staff in them as well. A lot of people don't include the staff or forget to include staff. Um, I like the question that was asked. Um, I think Aaron asked it in the chat. Um, that's a major concern for me is not just the staff. Um, you know, we know that we have a really good grasp on our staff, you know, temp checks. Uh, they know the symptoms, go home, you know, stay home type of thing. It's the public. Um, and that does go away if a rescue were to happen. Um, I, I definitely, I, I, the lap swimming in the lanes, um, you know, we have a huge issue with that. We have a lot of snowbirds down here in Florida and people have a sense of entitlement, like no tomorrow. And their lane is their lane. I don't care if I'm doing a swim assessment or not. Uh, they're gonna push me out the lane. Um, so that one would definitely be hard. We do have reservations built into our fee schedule, but we reserve those for uh, team rentals. So we, if you're an organized team coming in, that is your rental there. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we only see roughly, you know, I would say 100, 150 lap swimmers or so, and they're mainly the retirees and such there. But uh, I like that point of entry, the, the different points. That's definitely something easy people can do. Yeah, and just to, sorry, I'll circle right back to you. Just to um, bring up in the chat, if you didn't see it, what Devin was talking about, Aaron Wells brought up a really great point that was, um, social distancing doesn't do anything for the safety of our lifeguards yep. if they have to make a save. And also um, what I've been seeing in the chat is that if we aren't allowed to teach lifeguarding classes or we're, you know, social distancing is still in practice, how can we safely do our jobs um, if there is a crisis or if there is a time of need? And um, I think that's all a really, really interesting perspective to think about because we don't want to put our staff or ourselves in danger um, just because we don't know if we have to break social distancing. Yeah, that's what I was going to continue on with is um, what was brought up in the chat and a lot of the, the comments are resounding in the same direction. We can't even do staff training properly with social distancing you guys we can't practice our emergency action plan we can't practice our in-water saves if there's social distancing so in my risk management opinion we can't be open if our staff aren't fully and properly trained and we can't do that with social distancing it was brought up in a risk management meeting a couple weeks ago i think aaron you were leading that meeting uh, and i just we keep getting told like, oh, we're gonna do, we're doing virtual in-service this month and we're gonna do this next month and this and this and this. But for me, that's not feasible because we're, we're putting our students at risk if we're not following the social distancing and we can't do aquatics with social distancing. And that's my soapbox. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Um, so kind of along these lines of like the social distancing and, you know, in the pool is one thing I know where our facilities, I'm from UCLA, our facilities, we've got a lot of outdoor space around our pools and stuff. Um, but the one thing that in my head and in my mind, I've just, I don't know how we could impose social distancing is in the locker rooms. Have you guys 
thought about that or does anybody have any ideas as far as that goes? Has anyone been to Trader Joe's lately? They have six foot squares for you to stand in getting into the store. And so that's something that we've like jokingly floated about that if we have to have like locker room space that we would put six foot markers down in our on our locker room floors. We so also would you also have, like limit like the people coming into the lockers too and basically have that line going out of the locker rooms? Okay. But also if you have like all gender single use locker rooms, then those are gonna have to be cleaned after each use, which unless we have a full time employee like standing outside the locker rooms to completely disinfect the entire thing, that is like thank you for bringing up the locker rooms. I was just thinking about that. That's definitely an issue. Um, Tagging on. Oh. Oh, sorry, sorry Megan. Megan, go um, ahead. So I jumped on the call late. Sorry, I had a I had a facilities meeting. Um, but there were a couple of things. I was just on a Connect Two call um, for Aquatics, and we kind of were talking about this whole social distancing concept. Um, and I had it written down. We were talking about journey mapping. So I don't know if everyone's kind of heard of that, but it's essentially like if you were to walk through your facility, what point? what points are your patrons touching? So all handles, all doors, chairs, anything like that. And then they showed like a virtual tour of a facility and brought up points of like, so the locker room, for example, talking about staggering what lockers could be used so that you maintain that appropriate distance and putting proper signage on the locker saying, hey, you can't use these because of staying six feet away or whatever. Then talking about for outdoor pools, like for chairs that are next to each other, you're gonna have to move those chairs and things like that. Um, I definitely think the, the emergency point that everyone is bringing up is very valid that if we can't help safely in an, in an emergency or we feel like we're putting ourselves and our students at risk, then all of that other work is kind of, in, in my opinion, it's unimportant then, it doesn't even matter. Um, but something else, I, I don't know if you guys had already talked about it, but one thing I'm a little conflicted with right now is um, I'm currently in, I'm at Towson. Our state is um, at home, only essential people are out. Um, so I'm considered a non-essential worker and my pool is still on. Um, while we have facilities workers who can kind of check on things, no one else can really do any backwashing or anything. So it was brought up to me about, hey, like we need to figure out backwashing. Are you going to go in? And I was like, um, there's a global pandemic going on and I'm a non-essential employee. I don't know how I feel about going in to do work on a non-operational pool right now. Um, so I kind of, <laughs> in a hazmat suit, I was just kind of curious to see, um, you know, if there are other individuals kind of in similar boats who are at, you know, stay at home or not stay at home, oh my gosh, who have a shelter at home order in place who still have their pools running. Um, I'm, I'm really torn with this whole, like, I need to do my job, but I also need to protect myself and to cap it all off. I just recovered from mono in March. So I'm like really nervous about my immune system. Um, I'm sorry, this is more like a personal thing I'm asking, but I was just curious to see kind of like, how are schools dealing with this? Um, you know, draining our pool isn't an option, I've been told, because we have capital projects that have to happen in August when our pool is drained. And if we knew for certain we were closing in the summer, I think that would be different. But at this point in time, we just, we don't know. So throwing that out there, seeing if anyone can give me I any help. I think that. most of your places should have a, um, a, like a letter or something that is, allows you to continue to go into work um, for those items. I, I think a lot of people fall in the non-essential category. Um, whereas if you really look at the bare minimum essential, it's probably just your police, fire, utilities, wastewater, such like that. But um, we still have our operator going in. Um, he's actually reduced to four days a week and he's using the modified emergency FMLA that came out by President uh, Trump uh, due to the fact that he has a you know kid at home and school and everything like that. Um, so I, um, I, I definitely think there, going back to that locker room thing really quick there, um, as we're all talking and such, we know we're going to have a staffing concern when we open up. If we open up and begin staffing those locker rooms, you know you're going to need at least two staff to stand outside of those locker rooms, one male, one female, 
to staff that. Um, going back into the safety, I don't know if you guys have, you know, front desk staff or they're all lifeguards or this, that's the case, but that would be a very heavy staff intensive. You're taking two lifeguards out or two staff just to watch locker rooms there. Well, and again, going back to Trader Joe's, um, they actually have somebody, because I've seen someone be like, nonstop disinfectant would be a lot. Trader Joe's has somebody standing there disinfecting and wiping down carts, everything you touch, kind of all that stuff. So again, not ideal, but some grocery stores are moving in that direction, if that is what they're going for. Something Megan. else to think about is with everything reopening, um, cleaning supplies are gonna be in short stock to begin with. Um, and that's something we're gonna to have to consider as well as if we're reopening, do we have the cleaning supplies to, to sustain staying open for an extended period of time? If, you know, if, you, if we can't make orders or if orders become too expensive to, to make. Another, in the same vein as that, this is Lizzie at Florida State, uh, we keep getting reports that this hurricane season is going to be worse than the ones before. And so they're talking about that now that we're going to go back into a cycle of everything's in short supplies and things like that. Uh, UK, at UK, we just donated all of our extra gloves, any masks that or protective gear that we might have had on hand for emergencies over to our med center. So right now I've got two boxes of large, all different sizes, but only two boxes of gloves left when we reopen. And then let's have Candace go next because I know she's been waiting for a minute. Oops, sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Sorry, I was just, <laughs> Megan, I was the one screaming your name, sorry. Um, I am actually <laughs> in the same boat as you. Um, I am just getting over strep throat, so I was 14 days away from everyone, but I am also required to um, go in and check our pool because our maintenance staff, while they walk our facility, they don't know about pool operations. Um, and so I'm going in, I'm not going in every day. I am intentionally going in in the evenings um, after basically everyone else has left campus, the maintenance staff have left campus, I am protecting myself. Um, and I, I have the same concern and fear as you. Um, if I'm being told to stay at home to be safe, why are you also asking me to do this? But we've had staff be furloughed, um, not from our specific department, but um, we are now basically being told you have to Kind of prove yourself if you're not a professor on campus that's actively teaching um planning for the fall semester is at a time where we need to um put you on hold till closer till time to return and then bring you back or can you document and prove your worth so that's sort of why um even though i don't feel safe going out to do it um still making those efforts to get to campus and make sure things are functioning properly Hey, Catherine from NC State. So um, I, Megan, was also in the same boat as you. I was dubbed uh, non-essential employee, um, but because of all of this, um, I now am an essential employee for um, medical stuff, um, but our director recently switched. I was going in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, adding tabs and doing all the things, um, but one of the things that I think about with the fact that the pool is, we're an indoor pool, but for the fact that both of our pools are not in use, I don't feel like backwashing right now is super essential. I think it just goes back to making sure that your chemicals are fine. Um, so maybe just communicating that with the people that need to kind of hear that to say that backwashing right now is not essential. I went ahead when this first started and did like a good backwash so that while the pools are still running, um, we're able to kind of run through the our sand filters. Um, but worst case scenario, when you do reopen, if you don't have the ability to backwash right now, just take a couple days to backwash the pool, give time for the pool to recycle, and then start again. Um, but I don't think backwashing is super essential right now. But again, like with what Candace said, my pump room, like I was just going in through my pump room doors on the side of the building, gloves, like protected myself. I knew no one else was going to be in that space. I grabbed Lysol wipes that I had here at home and brought them with me. Um, at the end of the day, you need to protect yourself. And I bet you that somewhere in your HR world as well, there's something that says that if you're concerned about your own health and safety, they, they can't really get you in too much trouble for that. Hope, 
hope that helped. Hey, one other um, on that. Um, I, I'm in the same boat as Megan. I have, uh, I have asthma, lung disease, stuff like that. So I'm extremely high risk. I actually got a note from my doctor that said um, she needs to work from home at, at all possible costs right now. And um, I would highly suggest doing something like that as well, if you can. Definitely one thing that hit me very hard is we had an employee that was not essential and we were requiring they still came in. Uh, this is one of our pool techs. We have a full-time and a part-time pool tech. And one thing they told me was, um, uh, I feel like you're having me choose my health over my paycheck. Um, and that hit me pretty hard. So we worked with HR to have that person once again, stay home and, and, you know, not getting a hundred percent of their pay, but they're getting something. But if, if it gets to that point that it's a health over, and I think everybody's saying that in the chat, you know, the pools and the facilities will still be there after COVID-19. We need to make sure that we're still there with them. So, you know, at that point in time, like, yeah, I think you have to say, backwash is not important. I see lower in the chlorine. Our chlorine is down enough. But keeping it at a level that, you know, you're, you're not getting these algae blooms or such like that, or your chemicals are all gone out of whack and everything that you have to spend three weeks now at the, at the back end of it. Yeah, and then could we get in the chat um, maybe how many people have either winterized their pools or partially drained or drained their pools just so that we can all kind of see what everyone's doing? Um, I can jump in real quick. Sure. A um, couple things. I know a lot of people are worried about the backwashing. I'll take this one here, but I'll see myself a little better. A um, couple things. Nobody really has to really worry about backwashing the pools not being used. Uh, when it's not being used, you're not having that much bio. Uh, so you can pretty much go to the ones without worrying about that. When you're at a lower, uh, when you're closer to sea level, you have a lot of hydrostatic pressure underneath your pools, especially when the, the depths that are in them. Having those pools drain can cause uh, huge structural damages and issues from all that hydroxidic pressure pushing up into an empty pool. You need that weight of the water holding that down to equalize that pressure underneath, especially a lot of places that are out on the East Coast that are at sea level and even below. Um, one thing to save money, whoops, one of the things to um, save money, you can shut off the heaters, but don't shut off your heat exchangers. You still want the water flowing through them so you don't have that buildup or any type of biofilm or bacteria growing in that. And then for your checks, a lot of pool companies in the area that, um, uh, that are available, they are doing a lot of facility pool checks for a lot of the bigger companies. Um, I know up in Baltimore, I can't remember, uh, I think if it's Waters one, Thorian's one in Baltimore. Uh, but a lot of them are offering a uh, few weekly uh, packages to come in a few weeks to check on your pools so you don't have to worry about your own staff coming in. So that's something else that you guys can uh, check out and look into. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like, um, Vaughn, do you have something that you would like to add? Because I know you had your hand up a little bit ago. No? Okay. Um, and something that I had seen in the chat a little bit ago was we were able to drain our pool, but then um, push all of our capital projects from August to now because all of our facility uh, management is deemed essential. So they're able to come in and uh, get some of those projects completed now. Great, so is there anything else that anybody would like to um, throw out to the group right now? We've got about 10 minutes. Um, one thing we're gonna be talking about this today is uh, we're still moving forward um, with end of the year student awards. Um, I think, I'm not sure exactly how they'll be delivered, but uh, we're talking about uh, their PAD folios. So if you grad graduate while still working for UW, you get a Ad folio. Um, I think a lot of universities do that, but we're still moving forward with that just to make sure that the students know we're still thinking about them and trying to keep them engaged. Um, so I, we're going to be talking about planning for that later today, um, which I think is pretty important, more so than usual right now, just because we want to make sure the students know that we're <coughs> in mind. Well, that's great. And then something else that's come up a couple times in um, the chat is alternative programming. 
And um, I, we brought this up, I think the first week. It, has anybody had time to think about your alternative programming as far as anything that you're potentially doing online? Uh, so Lizzie at FSU, we, I met with my, some of my team yesterday um, and we talked, we host a hundred mile club throughout the year. So swim a hundred miles, you get a t-shirt, water bottle, things like that. And so we are going to do, we're looking into do a hundred mile COVID edition and you can't necessarily swim, but if you have the opportunity to be in water, you swim one mile, you get one point for a mile. Again, this would just be honor system. If you run, we were talking about the exertion exchange of running one mile versus like four nautical or four miles is one nautical mile. I don't know. They're talking about all these. Some of them are some South Florida people who know boats, um, but like different exchanges like that. And you'd get so many points. And after you got to 100 points, you did the 100 mile COVID challenge. So we're looking at something like that was our first big virtual aquatics thing that we thought of. There's nothing wrong with those South Florida folks, Lizzie. <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah, our programming, our marketing department has kind of tiptoed along programming. Um, so with us being, I'm in the same state as Lizzie, just a few hours south of you here in Sarasota County. Um, and uh, our programming, us being at a stay at home order, we got, we're trying to tiptoe people staying at home if they don't have to get out or people getting out and doing these things. Even though our governor has kind of put out an order that was very lackadaisical. Um, and, you know, we're staying at home, but still go out, still boat, still fish, still do all these things. And it's like, what are people really staying at home? One thing we have definitely steered clear of, um, and I felt it was a liability to us, was these at-home joke swimming lesson videos that people are putting on about bathtubs and such like that. I did not want to put any of our staff in jeopardy of being liable if a kid accidentally in a bathtub went under because a parent saw these flutter kick joke videos that are not really, you know, funny, you know, people laugh at them that aren't in this arena. Um, but uh, one thing we, we did, uh, we went back to our swimming lessons to meet those younger kids and we kept putting out water safety tips, uh, the uh, whale's tails, um, all those little things there. So people can see actual information referencing the Red Cross videos that if you have a pool and such like that. Um, but uh, that's pretty much all we've done here. Adam, I just wanted to um, say to you that we actually just had a conversation about our student awards as well. Um, ours is called Night of Rec, so Night of Recognition. Um, and we just decided, there was talk about whether to rec like pre-record it during like the work week and then have it be available to our students, um, but then we felt that wasn't really, that was really impersonal. Um, so we've been talking about keeping our date and just doing a live feed um, where we will all hop on from wherever we are and then our students can join via social media. Um, and, you know, we're hoping that they'll still attend, but we wanted to at least put it out there, whether it's 10 people going, maybe a hundred, you know, um, just so that they know that we're still thinking of them. Um, and one thing I did, the other thing I did recently was I'm not doing in services. It's a little difficult to do any sort of American Red Cross training when I'm not with my students. Um, I think on the last call we talked about um, someone had, oh, I forget her name right now. Someone had talked about um, doing a scenario bingo. So I reached out to her um, and it was great. Um, so where you can put different scenarios on a bingo sheet, they pick five um, and then they can get like additional hours or a prize when they get back or whatever. Um, I took it as instead of doing in-service training with skills and whatnot and or with procedures, I'm doing it as a check-in for my students. Um, so we actually just took the time to, I kind of asked them how they were doing. I pointed out resources that we have available so that they could do workouts at home um, and things that we came up with as a campus rec department. Um, and then we also just had some fun conversations. So we talked a lot about Tiger King and <laughs> Netflix shows that are on. Um, and to hear their responses to that was great. Um, I was a little nervous because I didn't really have an agenda, so I wasn't sure how it was going to work or if it was going to be well received. They all attended and I had said it was voluntary and that they weren't getting paid for it. So I was really surprised that they all attended. Um, but I actually had a student email me afterwards and she was saying, you know, she's one of seven in a house right now, which uh, that alone just made me go crazy. Um, and she kind of feels like the black sheep in her family. 
and that she really appreciated the check-in time to talk with one another and to like see her friends who she hasn't been able to see. So it was a really nice experience for me, but also for them. So if you haven't done that yet or are thinking of it, even if you're like, no one's going to attend it, I would highly encourage it because they've been so inundated with email that the face-to-face, -face, as much virtual time as they can get with you, they probably appreciate it more than they even know. I think that's a great point. I've been sending a weekly email just to check in and letting everyone know that if they need to call like or Zoom just to check in, they can. Uh, so far, no one's really taking me up on that offer. Not surprised with my staff. Um, love them though. Um, so I think, I know a bunch of people are doing that uh, ner uh, Zoom family dinner things. I know a lot of people have done that. Um, so I think that's that's fantastic. Unfortunately, I have to go to the staffing now, but it's great seeing everyone. Have a good one. Yeah, and also something that I took from last week's um, chat that has gone fairly well is instead of sending an email, um, somebody last week said that they were sending uh, videos to their staff, so video updates. And that has been hilarious because we use Band app and I did live like the live one and then I spend 15 seconds at the end trying to figure out how to end it so um, they've all like the thread on the bottom of that they're like lol nice try um, but they've at least found those to be fairly entertaining and um, I can see that they've watched the videos and um, I've also somebody was talking about daily polls and so I've started doing polls every couple of days as well to just yep I see Morgan pets, songs, workouts. Yeah, I was like, what are you watching? And then there was a whole thread on Tiger King. Um, yeah, so the yeah. mental health part of it is huge right now. I mean, we are immediately, we have people that are stuck home. I don't know about you guys, if you guys have families that you guys live with or where you guys are at, but I know for myself, um, personally, um, a big thing, uh, my fiance and I were supposed to get married on May 4th. We're major Star Wars fans. And we had to cancel our plans and everybody in my department, my team got together. It was really cute for them, but you know, we're making it through, but her and I are trapped home now. You know, yesterday we were trapped home eight hours and I'm like, what is going on type of thing. And I know a lot of people are feeling that, you know, people I've been home since March 19th working. Um, and a lot of people are stuck in that time. So, you know, getting out, I love having those little pets pictures. Um, you know, we did a big thing among staff of, uh, show us your at-home workstation and everything like that. So it is very important that, and Aaron posted that, you know, our mental health, not just our student, that is absolutely important. You know, we take care of ourselves because we're going to set that tone for everybody underneath us to kind of um, allow, uh, allow them to be at ease at home during these times. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, just to throw out there, um, it is better if you set a Zoom up and you're like, hey, anyone that can come, hop on. And even if you only have seven people or two people, um, I have found that if you put it out there, more people are willing to show up than if they, if you make them reach out to you. So um, that's been, uh, oh my God, a baby photo challenge. <laughs> that sounds amazing. So um, they all sent us photos of themselves and we post it every day, different people every day and um, they would guess who it is. A lot of fun. And I think um, we've only got about another minute. What I um, am going to end on is if people haven't followed American University Aquatics, they started doing a TikTok challenge with all of their lifeguards and swim instructors. And so they are creating content that are either lifeguard based or what they're doing in captivity or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and I think that's a really good way to get your staff involved and also for us to be a little more relevant and figure out how to use TikTok. So um, yeah, I just wanna say thanks to everybody. Um, we have another one of these planned for next week, same time, um, same day. I got a few emails last week um, with suggestions for topics. So um, I'm Rochelle Williams, I'm at Western Washington University. You Google my name, my info will pop up. Um, please reach out with any topics you would like for us to cover. And it, as always, it's been so wonderful to see and hear from everybody. So um, yeah, thanks so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.